Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Amherst. I'm Rev. Michelle Buhite, the minister of this congregation. We are so glad you have chosen to join us in worship. As a Unitarian Universalist congregation, we affirm that we need not think alike to love alike, meaning that we are a faith community woven together in shared covenant rather than conformity of belief. This is the covenant that binds our congregation. Together we promise to gather in compassionate community, to celebrate diversity of thought and unity of spirit, and to seek wholeness for ourselves, our children, and our world. If that sounds like the kind of community you've been seeking, please see our website, uuamherst.org, and get to know us better. We begin our worship together by lighting the flaming chalice, the symbol of Unitarian Universalism, that embodies the light of reason and the search for truth and meaning, the warmth of friendship and community, and the fire of our commitment to bring more justice and compassion to a hurting world. February is Black History Month, and so we center black voices with this chalice lighting by Kristen Harper. Each day provides us with an opportunity to love again, to hurt again, to embrace joy, to experience unease, to discover the tragic. Each day provides us with the opportunity to live. This day is no different, this hour no more unique than the last, except maybe today, maybe now, among friends and fellow journeyers, maybe for the first time, maybe silently, we can share ourselves. The seventh principle of Unitarian Universalism affirms and promotes respect for the interdependent web of all existence. In recognition of all that connects us, we offer words of gratitude and responsibility. The campus of UU Amherst was once occupied by the Seneca Nation, one of the tribes that make up the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Today, we acknowledge the relationship they cultivated and nourished with this land. We are the grateful heirs of this deep connection. We say, Nyawe, thank you, in the Seneca language. We acknowledge the hurt that has been perpetrated toward indigenous people, and we covenant to live with respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. We give away our gratitude for the beauty and resiliency of this lovely planet that birthed us, nourishes and sustains us, and that will receive us back when life has used us up. Each week we include in our worship service a time for all ages, whether it takes the form of a story or shared images or some other shape, this time is meant to engage all of us at all ages and stages of life. This part of the service is an integral part of our worship as a multi-generational community of faith. Hi friends. I have a little bit of a content warning before we start. I'm going to be talking about civil rights activist Malcolm X and how he came to be an activist. And this includes references to slavery and discrimination. These references are developmentally appropriate and necessary for white children and adults to hear, but they are potentially trig triggering for black people and pe people of color. I'll be putting a, a photo of Malcolm on the screen. So if you are a black person or person of color who would rather not hear these references, please feel empowered to turn off your audio and I'll take the photo down when that part of the story is finished. So you know, it's time to turn it back on. So once upon a time, there was a man named Malcolm. Now, when Malcolm was born in Nebraska in 1925, he was given the name Malcolm Little. As a teenager, he was very good in school and he wanted to be a lawyer. Um, he did really well for a really long time, but he gave up when a teacher said that he couldn't be a lawyer. Now, why would a teacher say that? I know that all of my teachers always told me that I can be anything I want to be, and I say the same thing to the kids that I teach. So discouraging him from his dreams doesn't make sense, does it? Well, Malcolm was black, 
And his teacher believed that that meant he couldn't be a lawyer or a doctor or any other profession that was considered to be for white people. This was hugely disappointing for Malcolm, and he soon dropped out of school. So being Black influenced almost every part of Malcolm's life. It was suspected that his father was killed for being Black by racist people, just like folks like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor are still being killed for being Black by racist people. Malcolm realized that being Black even influenced his name. Not too long before Malcolm's time, his family was brought to the United States from Africa as slaves. They were stripped of their dignity, their freedom, and of their family names. Because enslaved people were considered the property of their white owners, they were forced to take their last names, which is how Malcolm's family ended up with the last name Little. When Malcolm was an adult, he decided to change that. He changed his last name to X and later explained in his autobiography that he chose X to represent the African family name that he could never know. Malcolm X continued to create change through his activism and ministry. He first became well known when he led a gathering of over 500 people demanding response after an incident of racially motivated police brutality in New York City. He met the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and both, uh, both men are considered father figures of the civil rights movement, but the two activists did have very different philosophies. Now, this is hardly a comprehensive overview of Malcolm's life or viewpoints, and I encourage you to do some more research and learn more. What I'd like to focus on is the fact that Malcolm chose to claim his identity and his values, and he made changes in line with that identity and those values. And that makes me wonder, what might that look like in our community? So last week in RE here at UUCT, the kids and I talked about the proposed eighth principle of Unitarian Universalism. This was developed by Paula Cole Jones, and through her work with UU congregations over 15 years, she realized that the seven principles as they exist now lack a commitment to dismantling race, oppressive racist systems. She thinks that if we clearly state um, and live up to such a commitment, it would amplify the other principles to their full potential. So she developed what she, uh, what she hopes will become the eighth principle of Unitarian Universalism. And the cool thing is that we're a living tradition and we can make changes like that. We can add and change things when new information becomes available. And so it is possible that this could become the eighth principle of Unitarian Universalism. And some congregations are already independently adding it. So in a minute, I'm going to read you the text of the proposed eighth principle. And while you experience those words, take a moment to reflect on what you think Unitarian Universalism could be at her full potential. Consider what legacy you would want for yourself if you were one day considered a parent figure in our movement and what it might take for us as individuals and as a congregation to make that legacy so. The proposed eighth principle of Unitarian Universalism. We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and in our institutions. May it be so. It was Olympia Brown who admonished, stand by this faith, work for it and sacrifice for it. There is nothing in all the world so important as to be loyal to this faith which has placed before us the loftiest ideals, which has comforted us in sorrow, strengthened us for noble duty, and made the world beautiful. Ours is a living tradition, open and evolving, inviting us to be co-creators of the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. We believe that the more beautiful world can be discovered and uncovered as we live principled lives, keeping our promise to foster more compassion and justice in the world. The principles and sources that we know and love were adopted by the General Assembly in 1984, 1985, and 1995. The road to adopting these guiding promises 
was filled with theological debate, passionate word-crafting, and a commitment to make the process and the resulting words as inclusive as the wide vistas of our faith. The additions and revisions to our principles and sources were never meant to be done and dusted. That has never been our way. As Alice Blair Wesley interpreted the covenant established by our spiritual forebears in the 17th century, though our knowledge is incomplete, our truth partial and our love uneven, from our own experience and from the witness of our faith tradition, we believe that new light is ever waiting to break through individual hearts and minds to illumine the ways of humankind, that there is mutual strength in willing cooperation, and that the bonds of love keep open the gates of freedom. Therefore, we pledge to walk in the ways of truth and affection as best we know them now or may learn them in days to come, that we and our children may be fulfilled and that we may speak to the world with words and actions of peace and goodwill. That new light is shining, waiting to break through individual hearts and minds to illumine the way for others. That new light is in the form of an eighth principle, an evolution and expansion of our sacred promise to radical inclusion and accountability. Its time has come. It is for us to stand by this faith and embrace the promise and potential of the beloved community. Our opening reading comes from Barbara A. Holmes' Race and the Cosmos, second edition, from Chapter 7, A Community Called Beloved. The community called Beloved is not a static idea. It can be revised. During the 1960s, we imagined such a community through the image of children of different ethnic backgrounds playing together. Perhaps we need a different vision, a vision that includes mutual obligations and belonging. Obligation is the awareness of our intrinsic connectedness to one another. The community called Beloved is personal, theological, and scientific. It is here and not here, for there is no here or there. We breathe and excrete and sing the beloved community. We discuss and imprison it. Sometimes we give it a lethal injection concocted from the pomposity and determination that we are right about the ways of the world. Even then, it does not die. Thanks be to God. Let us sing this song for the turning of the world That we may turn as one With every voice and every song We will move this world along And our lives will feel the echo of our turning With every voice and every song we will move this world along With every voice and every song We will move this world along And our lives will feel the echo of our turning Let us sing this song For the loving of the world That we may love as one every voice and every song we will move this world along and our lives will feel the echo of our loving with every voice and every song we will move this world along with every voice and every song we will move this world along and our lives will feel the echo of our loving let us sing this song for the healing of the world that 
we may heal as one with every voice and every song we will move this world along and our lives will feel the echo of our healing with every voice and every song we will move this world along with every voice every song we will move this world along and our lives will feel the echo of our healing and our lives will feel the echo of our With every voice and every song, we will move this world along, and our lives will feel the echo of our turning, loving, and healing of the world. It wasn't too long ago that we gathered in this virtual space and considered the great turning and our role in bringing it about. Just last week, we found reverence and love at the heart of waking from the dystopian nightmare. I hope today we will uncover a path to radical healing as we explore the proposed eighth principle of Unitarian Universalism. Then truly, with every voice and every song, we will move this world along by moving ourselves along. At the 2017 General Assembly, a study commission was appointed to consider adding an eighth principle to our foundational values statements. We covenant to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. (sighs) There's a lot there, and in just a moment we'll unpack these lofty promises Before we do that, I want to remind you of an important aspect of how we live our faith in community, and that is our governance through congregational polity. It's an important concept, as it differs from many other faith traditions where decisions are made via a top-down hierarchy. A decision is made and then adopted in a sweeping action. Our polity grants greater autonomy to individual congregations. As member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, our covenant is to celebrate and encourage the new light that breaks in individual hearts and to help that light shine in, among, and beyond us. The eighth principle is the light that is shining upon and through our living tradition. It is because of congregational polity that at least four congregations have already embraced the proposed Eighth Principle, even before it has been officially adopted by the General Assembly. These congregations have been testing its rigors and have been transformed in the process. So let us begin to unpack the proposed Eighth Principle and discover its gifts and challenges as it calls us to principled living. We covenant to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. This principle is unabashedly theological as it begins with journeying towards spiritual wholeness in a thoroughly Unitarian Universalist framework of working for good in the world. We recognize that our spiritual wholeness is only half determined by our personal practices. It is our work to create heaven on earth in the here and now that fulfills the other half. To help us define spiritual wholeness, let's again borrow Brene Brown's definition of spirituality. Spirituality is recognizing and celebrating that we are all inextricably connected to each other by a power greater than all of us, and that our connection to that power and to one another 
is grounded in love and compassion. Practicing spirituality brings a sense of perspective, meaning, and purpose to our lives. We covenant to affirm and promote journeying. We are still in process toward spiritual wholeness, recognizing and celebrating our deep connectedness to all by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community. Let's pause right here and unpack the phrase, beloved community. We throw this phrase around quite a bit, and it is useful to establish what we mean. According to Barbara Holmes, the term, beloved community, was first coined by the American philosopher Josiah Royce, who lived between 1855 and 1916. Martin Luther King Jr. used the phrase in his sermons to describe a reconciling and safe place where people of all nations could enter with the innocence of children and dwell in this place of peace. According to Holmes, the community called beloved is not a static idea. It can be revised. During the 1960s, we imagined such a community through the image of children of different ethnic backgrounds playing together. Perhaps we need a different vision, a vision that includes mutual obligations and belonging. Obligation is the awareness of our intrinsic connectedness to one another. We need a vision that includes mutual obligations and belonging. That might just be the frame through which we explore the rest of the Eighth Principle. Our mutual obligations include our actions of accountably dismantling racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. This means recognizing these in ourselves, as well as calling them out in society. I just used the phrase calling out, and I want to make an important distinction between calling out and calling in. We call out behaviors and systems, but we call in groups and individuals, calling them in to relationship and conversation. When we feel called out, we experience shame, which doesn't bring out the best in any of us. Being called in is an expression of love and care, an opportunity to repair and restore. So what does it mean to accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions? I think this is where mutual obligations and belonging can help us to understand. We are accountable to one another and to the power greater than ourselves that connects us. We are accountable to be in relationship with Black, Indigenous, and people of color and ask what their needs are rather than charging in with our own assumptions and big plans. It doesn't matter how good our intentions may be, we can still cause harm if we don't consider the impact of our words and actions. Beloved community is about belonging, and we help to foster that as we are in relationship. We covenant to affirm and promote, journeying towards spiritual wholeness, by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. It is a hard truth, my friends, but we need to do the interior work of dismantling racism and other oppressions in ourselves. Like a goldfish in a bowl, we are immersed in it, Ask the goldfish to describe the ocean or what water feels like. One is too mythical and the other too close to understand or be able to communicate. Every single one of us was born into racism. Our parents and their parents and their parents back countless generations were born into it. It was the air they breathed, the unspoken assumptions of the society they lived in, It's just part of the way things were. Part of waking from the dystopian nightmare is confronting these social norms that we are appalled to be part of. The answer is not to pretend otherwise, but to tenderly bring these truths to the light. I think it is useful to point out 
that we are to dismantle racism and other oppressions, not mindlessly obliterate them. To attempt to destroy them without understanding them and how they have protected or impacted us would not provide the insight to avoid falling back into old stories and behaviors. We must dismantle them, bit by bit, piece by piece, understanding how the interlocking puzzle held us in thrall. That is the work of a lifetime, maybe more. But if we were to embrace the work of dismantling racism and other oppressions in ourselves and in our institutions, we would leave a legacy of hope for future generations. We would be truly good ancestors. It is my prayer that the Eighth Principle will be ratified and adopted by the General Assembly. In the coming months, I will offer discussion opportunities via Zoom so we can be intentional about how we move forward. If you're thinking, our seven principles are good enough, we don't need a new principle, well, I hope you will participate in the coming dialogue. We need your insight and contributions as we confront our own complicity in systems that marginalize and oppress. As Helen Rivers, Director of Religious Education at the UU Church of Tallahassee affirmed in our Time for All Ages, the proposed eighth principle is meant to complement and amplify our existing principles, adding weight to important ideas like the inherent worth and dignity of each person and justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. Yes, the existing seven principles are meant to be inclusive of all people, and adding an eighth principle that is explicitly multicultural amplifies these messages. I should tell you, we've been preparing for the eighth principle for quite some time. When our weaver and tapestry artist Pam was designing the rainbow tapestry at the back of our sanctuary that equates the seven principles with the colors of the rainbow, we included borders of black and brown to include this principle in the beauty of the symbol of our gathered community, our beloved community. We have been intentionally centering the voices of black, indigenous, and people of color in the music and readings of worship, a task that has been somewhat easier during the pandemic as we created virtual services. It can be challenging to ask people to leave their own spiritual homes on a Sunday morning to come and share their thoughts with us. One of the beauties of pre-recording virtual services is the ability to functionally be two places at once. We've established relationships with these artists as we sought permission and compensated them fully and fairly. It's true. We presently have very few, if any, members who identify as black, indigenous, or people of color. But we can do the work to be ready for them when they come, creating a community of faith where they'll feel affirmed and at home. We can expand our music and worship to center more non-white voices, styles, and experiences. We can create covenants to help them feel seen we can explicitly state the importance of their experience and our commitment to dismantle systems of oppression by adopting the eighth principle that binds us to these commitments. You see, this is our work to do. We mustn't wait for someone to show up and then put the onus on them to either fit in or be our guides in the work of dismantling our own and our church's insidious racism. I know, it's not comfortable to think about racism in our congregation, but it's there. It's the air we breathe. It's what we were born into. We didn't create it, but we can dismantle it with humility and love, healing all of us in the process. It is up to us to do the work to be ready to partner and be in relationship. Remember, the work extends beyond our walls, these practices will make us better allies and neighbors, better citizens of a multicultural world, and it will make us better ancestors for the future lives we are working to transform. With every voice and every song, 
we will move this world along and our lives will feel the echo of our turning, loving, and healing of the world. This is the beginning of a conversation, not the closing statement. We will journey toward spiritual wholeness together, strengthening the bonds of our beloved community and opening wide our doors to those who hunger for a faith whose mission is to bring heaven to earth here and now and for all people to dwell in peace and love in a new vision of beloved community that is built upon mutual obligations and belonging. This is who we are. As Holmes writes, the community called Beloved is personal, theological, and scientific. It is here and not here, for there is no here or there. We breathe and excrete and sing the Beloved community. We discuss and imprison it. Sometimes we give it a lethal injection concocted from the pomposity and determination that we are right about the ways of the world. Even then, it does not die. Thanks be to God. We are learning to live into our potential as beloved community, understanding that the community begins with our transformed selves and extends in concentric circles to our families, friends, faith communities, regions, and beyond, encompassing all of life on this miraculous planet we call home, and even beyond to the cosmos that gave birth to all of it. Building the beloved community is paradoxically intimate and global. When will we finally understand that we are a part of all of it and respond to all who share this planet with loving kindness? Thinking and I'm thinking, what's the reason why we holding back from being kind? What's the disease? But then I sense we are fine. It'll all happen one small step at a time. When the world is full of violence and it needs a little kindness, I just sit and pray in silence. And God shows me the signs. Open my eyes, realize we are fine. One small act at a Last time Last night I'm walking home and the homeless man says hello With a smile to let me know that he's got a lot of hope He says have faith, young man, we are fine The world is kind One small act at a time Small acts we do together Even though maybe alone changes the world for the better So we can call it home And this is life as we know When our hearts are aligned The magic that unfolds one small act at a time Throw your hearts up, let it fly high Let your love for all the world spread through the sky Let it drop down, let it all go Spreading kindness to every single living soul Can you see your love for me shining through? Cause what you see in me, I can see in you And soon enough, you and me will be out of time Kindness will be all we can leave behind Yeah, feeling grateful today Never thought this day would come Where I would feel it and say that Each and every one of us has paved the way Doing good and now we're all just moving up When I'm kind to you, you pay it forward This is how we yeah. build trust Never had faith, but now I'm seeing you I, to, I want a gift in my life Wanna spread love before I die Thank you God for finally letting me realize When I serve man, I'm really serving you in disguise Smiles everywhere cause now everybody's got the bug Ain't no life without the love If it is, it ain't no fun What we gonna do now? Just grab a friend and give a hug Spread it out real wide so everyone can be touched Throw your hearts up, let it fly high Let your love for all the world spread through the sky 
drop down Let it all go Spreading kindness to every single living soul Can you see your love for me shining through? Cause what you see in me I can see in you And soon enough you and me will be out of time And kindness will be all we can leave behind Every single living soul Can you see your love for me shining through? Cause what you see in me I can see in you And soon enough you and me will be out of time And kindness will be all we can leave behind Thank you for joining us in worship today. Please see the credits at the end of this service for information about the music and other worship elements. And do take a moment to visit our website, uuamherst.org, and click on the giving link. Or text your gift to 833-987-1968. We close this time of worship as we extinguish our chalice with these words. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. If we have any hope of transforming the world and changing ourselves, we must be bold enough to step into our discomfort, brave enough to be clumsy there, loving enough to forgive ourselves and others, May we, as a people of faith, be granted the strength to be so bold, so brave, and so loving.